Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today as we discuss exactly how you can find strength amidst stress and sadness. My name is Dr. Jean Ketzelman. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and certified applied prevention and health promotion therapist. And I specialize in teaching people with chronic and unresolved pain or suboptimal health the precise ways to reclaim their lives and achieve their goals. So during this presentation, we will be covering what the research shows to help the majority of people. But please keep in mind that each person is an individual. So the content and information within this program is educational only and should not be relied upon for the purpose of replacing formal medical care please be sure to consult with a licensed healthcare provider if you are experiencing undiagnosed pain, poor health, illness, or other symptoms, or if your condition is either worsening or not improving. It's important to always check with your doctor prior to starting a health practice or routine and do not discontinue or modify any medication or other physician recommendations prior to speaking to your physician. It's been a really difficult road lately, and we've all come to see the importance of social connection and support. If you are struggling, please reach out for professional mental health support. Begin by speaking to your physician and or a licensed mental health professional. But today, I'd also like to introduce you to powerful, research proven and practical ways to find strength and hope in times of stress or sadness. Although medications and therapy are very important under the right circumstances, they are not the only methods shown to be effective in battling these conditions. So we will discuss various strategies to consider incorporating into your overall approach to reclaiming your life. The path to reclaiming your life begins with self-compassion. And to understand how that is and why that is, we really need to understand what compassion is in general. Compassion is often thrown around with a number of words, right? We often hear people talk of sympathy, empathy, and compassion, and it's not always clear on what the difference is between the three, but it's important that we take the time to understand it so that we can really use compassion appropriately. So let's begin with sympathy. Sympathy is feeling care or concern for someone, and it's basically feeling bad for someone. On the other hand, empathy is experiencing the pain as your own. So you're sharing pain. If somebody is going through a difficult time, you feel that difficulty that they're going through as if it's your own. So in empathy, you are feeling bad with someone. Finally, in compassion, you're transforming the pain, that sympathy or empathy into kindness. That's the key, right? It's feeling and expressing kindness towards someone. So again, sympathy is feeling bad for someone. Empathy is feeling bad with someone. And compassion is feeling and expressing kindness towards someone. So the big difference between compassion and the other two is that it's not about the feeling bad. Yes, you experience that difficulty, you experience the sympathy or empathy, but you transform it into kindness and you express that kindness towards someone. And so we're bringing this up because compassion isn't just about expressing that or feeling that towards another, but you can use compassion towards yourself. So self-compassion is a path of action. It's not about being stuck in the negative aspects of the pain, but it's taking that pain and then transforming it into kindness. So let's talk about the steps of self-compassion and how we can use it to get the most out of this process, right? So there are three pieces of self-compassion that we're going to discuss. Awareness, which is often spoken of as mindfulness, and then interconnectedness 
and then finally kindness. So we'll go through each one of these in detail. So we begin this process with awareness, which is often referred to as mindfulness. And what mindfulness is, is simply purposeful and non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. So it's recognizing the present experience and seeing things as they truly are. And that's the key, seeing things as they truly are. It's not about lying to yourself and saying that things are better than they are, but at the same time, it's also not going down the stories in the head and, and going down all the what ifs and the possibilities and then seeing things worse than they are. So it's all about seeing things as they truly are without judgment. So from there, we move on to the next piece, interconnectedness, which is understanding that you're not alone. And this is extremely important. There has been a wealth of research that's come out showing the impact that loneliness has on overall health. So just the experience of loneliness has a significant impact on our health. So this is what the research has shown. There are many dangers of low social connection. It's worse for health than high blood pressure and obesity, and it's on par with smoking. It, so loneliness also um, is associated with higher inflammation at the cellular level, higher susceptibility to anxiety and depression, slower recovery from disease, increased antisocial behavior and violence, and suicide. But the benefits of high social connection is a 50% increased chance of longevity, stronger gene expression for immunity, higher self-esteem and empathy, better emotion regulation, and social connection creates a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, and physical well-being. So there is enormous benefit in feeling socially connected and not experiencing that loneliness. And the thing is, the important thing to understand is that you really are not alone. There are millions of people who are affected by mental illness each year. One in five U.S. adults experience mental illness. One in 20 adults experience serious mental illness. And even 17% of youths between six and 17 years old experience a mental health disorder. So to break it down even further and kind of reiterate a few points, one in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year. One in 20 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year. One in six U.S. US youth age six to 17 experience a mental health disorder each year as well. 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by age 14 and 75% by age 24. And suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 34. And that's just uh, unbelievable when you really hear that. Starting from the age of 10, it's the second leading cause of death. So the important things to realize is that yes, everyone's story and circumstances are unique, but pain, sadness, fear, anxiety, they're universally shared experiences. So you're not broken, you're just human. And that is so important to understand. Now, from that understanding that we are going through this universally shared experience, it's important to now tap into the power of kindness. Research shows that performing acts of kindness boosts happiness and well-being. These positive effects that happen of happiness and well-being occur when you are being kind to those who are dear to you. So those you are close with and you know well, expressing kindness towards them has been shown to improve happiness and well-being. But it's not just that, it's also being kind to those who you do not know well. Also being kind to yourself 
And what's really amazing is that just observing acts of kindness has been shown to improve happiness and well being. So, in other words, surround yourself with kindness. Be kind to others and be kind to yourself. And when it comes to being kind to yourself, it's especially important to focus your attention on the things you can do to reclaim your life. And that brings us to our next point and what we're going to be spending the rest of today's discussion on. And that is what I call the convergent pillars of wellness and performance. These are the five aspects of wellness that the research has shown can really help impact health, wellness, and overall mental physical performance. So we will go through each one of these five in more detail, and we can cover how we can use these five to really reclaim our lives. All right, so we'll begin by speaking about our first pillar, which is state. And state is just another way of saying the balance between stress and recovery. So to really understand the balance between stress and recovery, we need to take a little bit of time to understand how our nervous system works and what influence stress has on our body and mind, right? So there's a part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And that's the part of our nervous system that is associated with the automatic processes of our body. Now that autonomic nervous system is divided into two sections called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the part of the nervous system that's associated with the stress response. And it's often referred to as fight, flight, or freeze. So you may have heard this before where many people would talk about adrenaline and speak about a fight or flight response. And so that's the part of our nervous system that's associated with a stress response, the sympathetic nervous system. Then you have the parasympathetic branch, which is all about the recovery. It's referred to as rest, digest, and recover. And it brings us down from that stress response. So both of these are extremely important. It's important to understand that it's not like the sympathetic fight or flight is all bad and the parasympathetic rest and digest is all good. No, they're both extremely important. But the main thing is trying to make sure that there's the right balance between the two. An imbalance in either direction is what we don't want. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time just going through a couple examples of how that sympathetic stress response ends up influencing our body. And I think that this understanding is going to help a lot to really understand the stress that you may be experiencing. So in general, stress can be seen as anything that brings us out of our comfort zone. And it can be emotional or physical, right? So there could be something difficult that you're going through emotionally. And of course, that can be stressful. And that's what we're all very familiar with when it comes to stress. But keep in mind that there's also physical stressors, such as a physically demanding activity or even exercise, that it takes you out of the comfort zone. And that is a stress response on the body. It does bring you into a sympathetic nervous system state. Okay. So again, if anything brings you out of the comfort zone, you go into the stress response, the sympathetic part of your nervous system. So what happens? First, adrenaline begins to get released and you begin to be more alert. The pupils dilate. And the reason for that is that your body wants to hone in its focus on whatever it thinks is most important. So you want to be able to see the important things in that stressful situation. But that next piece I wanna spend a little bit of time talking on, during that sympathetic stress response, our vigilance goes up. And what vigilance is, is this tendency to specifically look for what can go wrong. So whenever you go into that stress response, our brains are wired to see all the things that can go wrong. 
it's there for survival. It's actually a good thing in certain situations. It keeps us safe. So this isn't necessarily a negative thing when it comes to short-term stressors, right? It's there for a reason. The problem is when stress begins to be chronic, when we begin to have stress for long periods of time and don't get back into that parasympathetic rest, digest, and recover state because then we end up spending the majority of our time day in and day out only seeing what could go wrong. And again, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you or wrong with the person that is experiencing this. This is hardwired into our nervous system. When we're in that fight or flight response, we are looking for what can go wrong, right? So in addition to all of that, in this stress response, our, st our sensitivity to various sensations will go up. And when we are under chronic stress, we actually experience more pain. So the sensitivity to pain actually goes up under circumstances where you're in chronic stress. Additionally, with the stress response, with the sympathetic nervous system activation, your heart rate will go up and your blood vessels will actually begin to change in a way that certain blood vessels will constrict and you'll have higher blood pressure, while other blood vessels may dilate. And so this is very interesting because our brains and our nervous system in the background without any of our kind of thinking or our knowledge, it'll make a decision on what parts of our body are most important for survival in that moment. So again, this is a stress response, the whole goal is survival. So in the background, our brains and body will determine what parts of the body need more blood for survival, and it'll actually increase blood flow to that area. But then it'll also determine what doesn't need so much blood, and it will constrict blood flow in that area, so it'll decrease blood flow. And that's why many people with chronic stress end up having high blood pressure, right? Because a lot of the blood vessels end up constricting. So then in addition, we begin to breathe faster and more shallow. And there is a direct link between the sympathetic nervous system, right? That stress response and digestive organ function. So going back to what we just said about blood flow, our, our brains and bodies are going to bring blood to areas that are needed for survival. But in a stressful situation, digestion is not a priority. So there's actually less blood flow going to the digestive organs. And so they don't function as well in those states. Now, in the short term, if there is a rapid stressor going on, that's okay. And that's normal. We need that. We need blood to certain areas and digestion really isn't a priority. Again, the issue is chronic stress, stress that keeps going and going and going day after day because it'll begin to really impair and impact our digestive organs. And that is why many will often have these digestive system issues with chronic stress and of, often an uncomfortable feeling in their belly. So another piece too, kind of moving on from that, uh, the stress response also influences our hormones, right? It increases cortisol and it increases blood sugar. So let's talk about that for just a little bit. Cortisol is a very, very powerful um, hormone, right? It is a stress hormone and it's released under times of stress. But it's not all bad. Many people associate cortisol with an all bad kind of situation, right? The, the, um, cortisol basically gets a very bad rap, but we have cortisol for a reason. So one of the things that cortisol does is that it triggers our body to put more sugar into the bloodstream. So why does it do that, you might ask, right? So the reason why is that, again, in a stressful situation, our bodies know we need more energy. Sugar is a key energy source. So cortisol is released. So that cortisol then triggers our body to put more sugar into our bloodstream for more energy. 
And in the short term, that is very good. It brings us more energy and that's great. It's when there's chronic stress, right? When the stress keeps going and going and going, where we, where we may end up having this increased level of blood sugar overall, day after day, which could change the way our insulin functions and could potentially begin to impact things like diabetes, right? So again, in the short term, this is a great thing and it's there for a reason to help us overcome this challenge. But chronic stress is where this becomes an issue. Now, another thing that cortisol does is it also helps us store memories associated with stressful or painful situations. So that's a very interesting point that during these stressful situations, cortisol gets released and that cortisol helps us remember these things that are going on. And again, it's there for survival so that we can be more prepared in the future to deal with these things. But what ends up happening over time is that this, that these negative thoughts and these negative memories really become engraved in our minds and may have a number of not so desired outcomes later on. All right. And then finally, the stress response does impact our immune system. So in the short term, you know, a short term stressor, um, just like an immediate thing that we need to deal with it actually decreases our inflammation. But in chronic stress, we end up having increased inflammation. And then again, in the long term, this decreases our overall immune strength and our immune function. So as you can see, the stress response has a direct impact on a number of um, processes within our body, and it really impacts many aspects of our health. Now, it's there for a reason, though, and these short-term stressors are, or our response to these short-term stressors are very good because it helps us overcome them. So all of these things where our eye our um, pupils dilate, our heart begins to beat faster, we begin to breathe more rapidly, all of that, our cortisol gets released so that we have more sugar in our blood. All of that is fantastic because it helps us overcome the challenge in the short term. But if you have this stress that's going on and on and on and on, it begins to have a negative impact on our overall health. So the overall goal is to balance this sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze with the parasympathetic. Our goal is to go from the stress response when we have a stressful situation, which is normal, everybody goes through them, but then once that stressful situation is over, we want to shift into that parasympathetic rest and digest so that we can finally recover, all right? And that becomes a big skill, and we're going to talk about some ways to do that, of how do we shift out of that sympathetic state. So we're not chronically in that stress response and we could actually begin experiencing that rest, digest and recover state. So one technique or one approach that the research is quite clear on helps is breathing. Now, very, very many people will hear, oh, just take a deep breath, you'll feel better. And it does help for the most part, but there's a lot more to it than just take a deep breath, right? There are very many people that even with that advice will try taking a deep breath and only agitate them even more, right? Because there are very kind of specific details when it comes to the breath that when you know these details and you use it to your advantage, you can really harness the power of the breath. So the first thing that we'll talk about when it comes to this is that the, um, the kind of hole in which the air comes in and out of really does make an impact, okay? So of course, when you're breathing, you can either breathe through the mouth or through the nose. And what's been shown is that mouth breathing is more so linked with a sympathetic response, a stress response, 
while the nose, breathing through the nose, is more so associated with a parasympathetic recovery response. So, I mean, even just think about it, if you're thinking about somebody who's had a, who's having a panic attack or is hyperventilating, it's unlikely that they're breathing through their nose. They usually have their mouth open and really breathing hard, right? Or think about somebody that's going through a very um, difficult workout, right? And they're gasping for air. They're usually not breathing just through their nose. They're usually gasping for air through their mouth. Right. So in those high stress situations, whether it's emotional or physical, usually mouth breathing is more so associated with the stress response, while nose breathing is more so with that parasympathetic recovery response. Next, we're going to look at where or what expands the most when you're breathing. So in other words, the difference between breathing primarily through the chest and breathing through the diaphragm or the belly. So breathing primarily through the chest where you take a deep breath in and your chest comes up, that's more so associated with that sympathetic stress response. Again, picture somebody who's having a panic attack or breathing hard from exercise. So panic attack from emotional stress exer or, and breathing hard from exercise from a physical stress. Both of those situations, usually the chest is going up. There's a lot of movement happening in the chest. On the other hand, you look at somebody that's very, very calm and relaxed. It'll often be more so through the belly. The shoulders are nice and relaxed, right? And that's another piece why many people going through this, these stressful times will often complain of neck soreness because the breath ends up being so much up in the chest, up in the neck, that those muscles are constantly turned on with each breath. And so they can't get a chance to rest and they become very tight and sore. But if we bring the breath down into the belly and let the shoulders and neck relax, we can go into that parasympathetic recovery state. So when you breathe in, the belly expands, like you're bringing in air into a balloon that's in your belly. And when you breathe out, it comes down. And then finally, we're going to talk about the difference between fast breathing versus slow breathing. So let's look at what the research has shown on that. Slow breathing techniques have been shown to increase comfort, relaxation, pleasantness, and vigor and alertness, while they decrease arousal, anxiety, depression, anger, and confusion. So in other words, by breathing fast, you're more likely to go into that sympathetic stress response. Again, picture difficult to exercise or a panic attack, right? It's typically going to be fast breathing. On the other hand, slow, controlled breathing is more so associated with that parasympathetic recovery state. All right, so let's just kind of sum up a couple of these points, right? The goal in order to come from that sympathetic stress response back down into that parasympathetic recovery response, we want to inhale and exhale through the nose keep the mouth closed, and keep the tongue on the roof of the mouth. You also want to breathe more through the diaphragm. So allow the belly to expand on the inhale and it to come down on the exhale. Now, one thing, I want to go back a couple slides, and there's a question that I often get asked with all of this, and that is, what happens if my nose is stuffed and I just cannot breathe through my nose, right? So a couple of pieces with that. First, kind of the big suggestion is first at least try. You may be surprised after a little bit of time of working on it, you may be surprised that your ability to breathe through the nose does improve. So that's number one, begin trying to work on it. But of course, if you get to a point where it's stressing you out more to work on it, then it's not worth it at that point, okay? So that brings me to the next recommendation. And that is you want to do as many of these three different factors as possible. 
All right, so we've covered like factor number one is mouth versus nose. Factor number two is chest versus diaphragm. And factor number three is fast versus slow. So those are three factors that can affect how the breath affects our stress levels, all right? So you want to do as many of the three as possible. So in other words, if you can't breathe, breathe through the nose, you could only breathe through the mouth, at least do your best to breathe through the diaphragm, the belly, or and breathe slower, okay? So try to get at least those two in. And then over time, maybe you can get to the nose, but if not, those two are still incredibly powerful. And if you can't do those two for whatever reason, or let's say the diaphragm breathing is just very challenging, you're working on it, but it's still a challenge, the technique isn't right on, it's so, okay, at least begin working with slowing down the breath and practice breathing through the belly. And then eventually with practice, it will become easier. As your stress levels go down, you'll be able to breathe more through the belly and breathing more through the belly will bring your stress levels down. They go hand in hand. So you'll begin to see that it's gonna be easier to breathe through the belly. And again, finally, you may get to the point where you can breathe through the nose as well. All right, and so the last piece that I want to talk about when it comes to state is the power of our focus. So in other words, the way we use our minds matter. There has been quite a bit of research looking at how the way we see our stress impacts the way our bodies respond to that stress. So remember, a stress is anything that brings us out of our comfort zone. But we can see that stress in two different ways. We can see it as a challenge, which is a difficult situation, but we know it's possible to overcome it. We know we have the means to overcome this difficult challenge or this difficult situation. Or we can see it as a threat, which is a difficult situation where you doubt your ability to overcome it and you believe that the situation can actually kind of overcome you, okay? can, can break you down in some way. So there are these two ways of looking at this um, a stressful situation, as a challenge or as a threat. So seeing things as a threat has been shown in the research to increase negative thoughts. And it does that because remember, that when you see things as a threat, you end up having more of that heightened vigilance where you're concentrating on what can go wrong. Remember that sympathetic fight or flight, you have that vigilance, you're looking at what can go wrong and that's hardwired in us. So when you see things as a threatening experience, you're, you're going to be on very high alert and constantly looking at what can go wrong. Additionally, seeing things as a threat has been shown to decrease your cardiac efficiency and increase blood pressure. In other words, it's going to decrease your overall cardiovascular health and performance. All right? But seeing things as a challenge has been shown to do the opposite. When you see things as a challenge, even though it's a stressful situation, but you see it as challenging, which means it's difficult, but you know you can do it, then we have decreased negative thoughts. Our vigilance begins to go down by seeing it as a challenge. And we actually have increased cardiac efficiency and lower blood pressure. So it improves our circulation. So in both of these situations, it's still stressful, but just the difference between seeing it as a challenge versus seeing it as a threat changes the way that we react to that stressor. So the goal is focus on the challenge. Even though it's difficult, I can overcome. That's the goal that you kind of want to be, um, or that's the way you would like to be thinking about things. Even though it's difficult, I can overcome. And this rapid heartbeat and uneasiness is just my body's way of giving me the energy I need to be successful. So remember that, remember when we talked about what the sympathetic nervous system does, that increased heartbeat, those, those jittery feelings, all of that, they're there for a reason 
and for a very beneficial reason. They're meant to help you overcome the challenge. They're a great thing, right? As long as it's in a short or a fairly short period of time and it doesn't go on longer than it should. So remember that when you're faced with a stressor, see it as a challenge. Realize that it is difficult, but you can overcome it. And all this uncomfortable feeling that you have, it's there for a reason. And it really is there for a reason to help us overcome this challenge and be successful. All right, moving on, we get to our next pillar, which is nutrition, looking at diet and hydration. So the research has shown that a pro-inflammatory diet, which is a diet that is highly processed, many processed foods, and also low in fruits, vegetable, fish, nuts, and legumes, was shown to be associated with a greater odds of depression anxiety, and psychological distress. So these higher inflammatory diets have been associated with increased risk of these conditions. Now, additionally, an anti-inflammatory diet, which includes fish, uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, and the avoidance of highly processed foods was associated with a reduced risk of depression. So these foods that we're putting into us, they are linked or they have at least some link with the with the anxiety, stress, depression, sadness. So it's really important that we are focusing on our nutrition and focusing on the inflammatory process of our nutrition, right? So I'd like to go over a few guidelines that are now kind of how nutrition is suggested to be done based on what the research is showing for the majority of people. Now, again, everybody is individual and certain diets are appropriate for certain people. But what I'm about to go over is what the research has shown to be effective for the majority of people and can help us bring down our inflammation. Right. So these guidelines were produced by Harvard based on the research, and I'd just like to share them with you a little bit here. So first, the suggestion is that approximately half of our diet is to be of fruits and vegetables, with the majority of it, of that half, being vegetables. So the more vegetables and the greater the variety, the better. And potatoes and french fries, they don't count, right? They're not the vegetables that we're speaking about. And then when it comes to fruit, it's suggested to eat plenty of fruits of all different colors, all right? So there's quite a bit of research showing that fruits and vegetables do have highly anti-inflammatory processes. And again, the inflammation has been linked with increased depression, anxiety, and mental health conditions. So we'd like to bring down our inflammation and fruits and vegetables have been linked with reduced inflammation. All right. Now moving on to the other half of our diet, it's gonna be split between whole grains and healthy proteins. So for whole grains, eat a variety of whole grains like whole wheat bread, whole grain pasta and brown rice, and you wanna limit refined grains like white rice and white bread. So these refined grains, they're highly processed. And remember that, the, that that processing or those processed foods are involved with increasing our inflammation. So you wanna eat whole grain whenever possible. And there are those that may have uh, sensitivities to things like gluten, in which case things like wheat, um, whole wheat and whole grain pasta may not be best, but that's a very individualized type of thing. And that's why it's always great to work with a nutritionist if you can when it comes to getting your uh, diet in check, right? And then finally, for healthy protein, you want to choose fish, poultry, beans, and nuts, but limit red meat and cheese and avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats. So remember, it comes back to that processing. All right. So now let's move on to the next pillar, which is movement. 
where we develop fitness and just physical activity in general. So in the research, it's been shown that exercise impacts both the physical health parameters as well as the mental health outcomes in those with mood disorders, including major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. And exercise also impacts anxiety and insomnia. So how much exercise do we really need? Well, the general recommendations right now are a total of 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. So that's a combined 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. And one key piece I wanna talk about there is that a bout of exercise, so a, um, for something to count towards that 150 minutes, it should be at least 10 minutes in length. So you're not really gonna be adding together the one minute here or the two minutes here. But every time you do a continuous 10 minutes of physical activity or moderate physical activity, you can place that towards your 150 to 300 minutes per week. Now in terms of exercise specifically, a way to break it down that the research has shown to be very effective is three to five days per week of aerobic exercise and two days a week of strength training resistance exercise. Both are very important, all right? But then in addition to that exercise, you wanna maintain proper sitting, standing, and lifting technique, and also change postures and positions within every 30 to 60 minutes at work or at school, or if you're anywhere where you're kind of stuck behind a desk for long periods of time, you wanna at least move in some way when possible. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that it's not just about exercise. It's physical activity in general that's very good for the body and the mind. So when sitting, again, change postures, positions within every 30, 30 to 60 minutes. But also, when possible, move and walk at least every two to three hours throughout the day, at least a little bit, some kind of movement. And then finally, deliberately increase physical activity demands during normal everyday tasks. So see when just in your normal everyday life, when can you allow yourself the opportunity to move more? So take the stairs instead of taking the elevator, park at the back of parking lots, go for a stroll around the block at lunch and avoid asking others to help get you things or bring you something. You wanna use every opportunity to move. The goal is not to see how we can move less or how we can make things feel easier in the moment. The goal is to use movement, exercise, physical activity to really change our body and minds for the best. And the research is quite clear in showing that it does. So use this to your advantage. Try to move when possible. All right, moving on to the next pillar, sleep, where we're gonna really focus on maximizing recovery. So the research has shown that poor or inadequate sleep has been shown to lead to future anxiety, All right? So in the study that I have here, when healthy volunteers were kept awake for 24 hours, they had higher anxiety levels the next morning than they did after a full night's sleep. So in other words, when sleep deprived, half the study participants reported anxiety levels typically seen in people with clinical anxiety disorders. So what does that mean? That means even if, even for those that may normally not have anxiety, just being sleep deprived increases anxiety. And so it's extremely important to make sure that we are focusing on our sleep because number one, if our sleep isn't as appropriate as we want it to be, then that alone may cause anxiety. But if we already have anxiety from other causes, then this is just adding to it. We're not able to, not only were we not able to recover from the stress of the anxiety that, that we have from other situations, but this is adding to it. Right, so it's just so important that we are focusing on our sleep. So how much sleep do we really need? The research shows that approximately six to nine hours of deep uninterrupted sleep would be 
an appropriate way to start, would be a good way to start. Seven to eight hours is recommended though. That would be ideal. Seven to eight hours with eight hours being best. But the research has shown that six and under has negative health outcomes, but also nine and above has been linked with certain negative health conditions as well. So that six to nine hour window would be ideal. And again, seven to eight hours is recommended, eight hours is best. So a couple of things that were kind of a tip that I'd like to speak about when it comes to being able to sleep as it relates to stress and anxiety. Bedtime worry, including worrying about incomplete future tasks, right? So thinking about things in the future that we know we need to do, that's a significant contributor to uh, having difficulty falling asleep, right? So laying there constantly thinking about what we need to do, what we need to do, we've, we've all been there, right? And that makes it very difficult to fall asleep. Well, research has shown that completing a to-do list prior to bed may help you fall asleep faster. So the idea is that this allows you to transfer the overwhelm out of your head and onto paper so that it's not constantly running through your mind all night, right? So if this to-do list consists of writing about tasks that need to be completed over the next few days. And the more specific the list, the better the results may be. Now, one last piece I want to add with this, my personal recommendation is that if you're using this technique, then after you're finished with this technique and you get everything out on uh, paper, spend a little bit of time on the, at those breathing techniques that we spoke about earlier, where you really work on maybe slowing down the breath, breathing through the belly and trying to breathe through the nose. So if you work on that, you can really help calm things down before bed. So you get all of your thoughts and all of maybe the stressors down out of your head and into onto a piece of paper, and then focus on yourself in terms of bringing that sympathetic fight, fight or flight state down into that parasympathetic rest and digest and recover state so that you're ready for bed. Okay, so now let's bring it all together. Let's piece everything together and see how it all fits. So remember, our goal here is to practice self-compassion. And self-compassion is not a practice of self-pity or complacency or any of that. No, self-compassion is a practice of action, right? And there are three pieces to self-compassion. So number one, we must have awareness. We must have the mindfulness, the awareness to see things as they are. So we experience a situation and it can be very stressful, but we see things as they are, not pretending like they're better, but also not believing that they're worse. Just seeing the situation in front of you as it is with as little judgment as possible then from that place, we realize that we are not alone, right? These, these feelings are universal feelings. Remember that the circumstance might be unique to you, absolutely, but the actual feeling of stress, anxiety, sadness, depression, that's universal. You are not alone. There are thousands, millions, if not billions of people in that moment feeling exactly what you are feeling, right? So now, from that place of seeing things as they are and realizing you are not alone and you are just human, from there, we practice kindness towards the situation. So we spoke a lot about the power of kindness. And the idea is that the kindness that we are speaking of right now in terms of self-compassion is kindness towards ourselves and towards the situation in a way that helps us ease the pain, right? So this kindness is fueled by a genuine desire to ease the pain. We must be kind to ourselves in order to help decrease this discomfort that we're feeling. So 
then the question is, what are these acts of kindness? How can we be kind to ourselves then? So we're going through the situation. We see things as they are. We realize that we're definitely not alone. And then how do we actually be kind to ourselves? Well, first, remember, sometimes we all need a little help. So speak to your physician and or a mental health professional. That is key, and that's a great place to start. But then from there, acts of kindness towards yourself, this, this uh, path of action, so to speak, is to incorporate these convergent pillars of wellness and performance into your overall plan for addressing the situation. So remember, there are five key pieces that we can do and use in order to help bring us out of this sadness and this stress, right? So first we have to understand state or that balance between stress and recovery. Remember that difference between being in a stress response, the sympathetic part, and the parasympathetic recovery part. So we're faced with a situation that brings us out of our comfort zone, right? And that is a stressor. Now we can see stressors as being either a challenge or a threat. And if we can take on those stressors as a challenge, we are really able to kind of hone in on our the beneficial responses within our body and we're able to take on that challenge and overcome it, right? And then we can also use the power of breath in order to help shift out of the stressful situation or that stressful response into that parasympathetic recovery response once the stressful situation is over. So you use that challenge thinking right, seeing things as a challenge to overcome the stressor. And then you shift out of that stress response with the breathing and get into that recovery response. Now with nutrition, the goal is to use an anti-inflammatory based diet and avoid the foods that may increase inflammation. So key foods that may increase inflammation are typically those that involve a lot of processing as well as refined sugars. And on the other hand, fruits and vegetables are among the foods that have been shown to decrease inflammation. And then sleep, remember, extremely important in terms of recovering from the stress and also decreased sleep is a stressor itself. Remember, not getting enough sleep is a stressor and you're going to potentially have more anxiety from sleep deprivation itself. You want to use movement in order to really also help um, decrease those feelings of sadness, uh, depression, anxiety, because the research is quite clear that it does have that power. And then finally, connection, which is what we've been talking about through all of this. Connecting with yourself through self-compassion and connecting with others, which can include others going through similar situations. Again, realizing that you are not alone in this and also reaching out for help from professionals. That is all extremely, extremely important. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's presentation. I really hope that the information that we covered today uh, has, is going to help you in being able to really battle that stress and sadness and transform it into true strength. If you have any questions about anything that we've covered, please don't hesitate to reach out. Again, my name is Dr. Jean Ketzelman and my practice is called Convergent Movement and Performance located in Bridgewater. If you have any interest, I would be happy to speak to you and we can work on really trying to individualize these approaches into your overall program. And if you're working with a current um, 
medical professional or, or mental health professional, then we can absolutely all integrate everything together and work together to get this plan going for you the best way possible. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you again for taking the time to be here today.